you guys all taking your seats. Um, tonight, I'm going to be giving uh, what we call the photo album. So part of it starts with the buttons that Lindsay was passing around. Um, and many of these pictures you guys have seen, we've put up highlight reels from the camera project. Um, but I just wanted to kind of bring it all together and give you more of a naturalist talk. If you were here a couple weeks ago when I gave another talk, uh, three weeks ago I think it was, we did a very data tech heavy talk. And I think that the, the intrepid audience that we had survived and learned and were smiling at the end. It was um, good. Thank you. Um, tonight we're going to go on the other side. We're going to do more of a naturalist adventure through the wildlife of the preserve. I'll be dabbling some data in there, but really this is supposed to be a feast of your senses so that you can appreciate the wild creatures that are in your backyard a lot of places. So, in 2014 we started the Wildlife Camera Project. And over the last four and a half years, basically, we have had uh, cameras of all of these uh, black points are where cameras have been deployed. Some of them are the Conservancy's cameras, and then some of them were homeowners' cameras. And it was part of a paired project, a uh, big citizen science project, that we essentially wrapped up last spring in 2017. I did a big report, shared a lot of our findings, um, and since then, we've continued to collect data on our cameras, and a lot of homeowners have collected their, their photos, but aren't necessarily reporting them anymore. So I didn't want to focus on the data a ton. I wanted to actually talk about the animals that we're catching on the cameras because it's clearly why you put the cameras out. You want to see them. You want to understand their behaviors. And the number of questions that I get about a lot of our species is it's awesome. I love how curious people are. But it also tells me that there's some real basic stuff that people just haven't learned. And so if I can help you understand that better so you get a foundation and then we can go from there, I'm pretty excited. So. Up to today, this is the percentage of observations that we've recorded on a species. I don't think anyone is surprised to see, I apologize, these came out a little smaller than I'd anticipated. Deer, this big green chunk, that's deer. We catch a lot of deer on the cameras. Uh, there are a lot of deer on the preserve. But then as you go through, there's some other big ones that jump out. This big red pie slice is bobcats. And they're over 13% of the observations compared to 46 for the deer, 13% are bobcats, which blew me away when we first saw that. Now, when I'm out in the field, I feel like I see bobcats fairly often, but I also see coyotes fairly often. But if you compare the bobcats to the coyotes, we only had 2% of our observations that were bobcats, we were coyotes. So we had nearly six-fold more bobcats. I quite honestly cannot tell you why that is. We'll talk about it a little bit when we get into the section on bobcats, but I find it really fascinating. And then we got turkeys, which feel like they're everywhere. They were under 4%. Skunk, they were at 2%. I bet you don't see skunks very often. So it's, it's all about what the wildlife's doing when we're not looking, right? So some of it is what we see ambiently. We see the deer everywhere. But the bobcats are out and about quite a bit, and we're not necessarily seeing them, which is why camera projects are so rich. They teach us so much about everything that's going on when you're not looking. Of course, we also have a lot of human activity. This is partly because this is an incredibly outdoor active community, but it's also because we targeted the cameras to the trail systems, where, where humans like to travel unimpeded by vegetation, so does wildlife. So it's a little biased in that sense. And then, of course, mountain lions. Everyone's always very interested in the mountain lions. They were at 3.3%, so pretty similar to coyotes and, um, and the turkeys. This is the summary of over 18,000 observations. And the observations are a distillation of literally over 1.5 million images that the Conservancy, the residents, and resident services, who's been checking cameras for a few members that are out of town a lot, um, that's the cumulative collection over the last four years. It's a truly mind-boggling number. And um, when I tell colleagues who are also doing camera projects, uh, what we've been doing and how we've been doing it basically with volunteers and citizen science, they're all very impressed. So, a little, little credit to the community that pulled this off. So tonight, I'm just going to pull out some of the highlights. I could have talked about every single one of those species that was on the first pie chart. But tonight, we're just going to focus on some of the more iconic and conversational species that I talk to you guys about a lot. So the first one is the Columbia black-tailed deer. 
It is by far the most visible species, large mammal species, on the preserve. And it's the same for California. It's the most recognized species across the state. Not necessarily the, black, the Columbia blacktail, but deer in general. The Columbia blacktail is a coastal species that's considered a subspecies of the mule deer. So if you know your deer, the mule deer is one of our larger deer species that is across the west. And the black tail has a few differences. The first is its namesake, the black tail here. A mule deer has a little black tip, but the black tail has a very large uh, black tail band compared to the mule deer. That is not to be confused with the white tail uh, deer, which we do not have here, but their tails are enormous and they go up and there's a big white flash on the knee and it's their alarm. So they put their tail up and they run off and everybody goes, oh no, something's up. The black tail don't use their tails that way. It's pretty interesting that they're that, they're that different. Um, the other thing about deer that uh, is really recognizable is the fact that they have antlers. Now antlers are different than horns, and I often hear people refer to the horns on that deer. And it is a, it is a colloquial term, but it is actually not a correct term. So horns grow for the entire life of the animal, and that would be on a, a bison or on a goat. Um, whereas on deer, they will grow new antlers each year. And what's fascinating is its bone. They're growing a new bony appendage out of their head once every year. And it's a huge energy expenditure. And why they've decided that this makes sense evolutionarily, there have got to be some serious trade-offs. What they use it for is, is defending territory and defending their, their harems of female uh, deer that they want to breed in the fall. So there's, they're, uh, they're making that exchange in energy consumption. When they grow these new antlers, is in the spring. So right now they have um, already grown the antlers and they're all hard um, bone now. But in the spring they've got this velveteen cover, which actually has a vasculature that helps grow the bone. So they, there's this whole system that grows the antler and then as it gets to the right size or the right time of year, the vasculature will retract, the uh, velvet uh, dries out and falls off, and then they've got their antlers. Then at the end of the rut, which is the breeding season, they actually shed these antlers. They will fall off. So if you ever see a deer rubbing towards uh, December through February, rubbing on its antlers, probably trying to get it off. I imagine it's like a really bad itch. You know, you really want to get a scab off or something like that. So um, when you are out driving around, if you happen to cross a deer at night, um, you may notice that they have white eye shine. And I'll be highlighting the different eye shines as a different species. But next time you're on the road at night, hopefully driving safely, um, you can try and identify the eyes that you see on the side of the road. A typical deer uh, can live nine to ten years. That's on the upside. They can, um, depending on the hunting pressure and the predator pressure, it can be lower. It could be as low as four years. And the local population, I could not find any data on. But the estimate for the statewide deer population, which is several different subspecies of deer, is, uh, is just over a half a million deer in, in California alone. Alright, so the rut is the breeding season, and the reason that they have antlers is so that they can tussle. And so we call this sparring. Sometimes you'll see the deer sparring lightly and then taking a break. That's where the juveniles are practicing how to fight. These guys are going, going at it. This is probably a real fight for territory and for the, and for the right to breed the does. Um, this is not only exhausting because they have to be constantly on alert and looking to see who's trying to, to poach their ladies. And then they've got to fight when the, when the moment arrives. And then sometimes they get injured. So the deer will put on weight before the rut, before the fall arrives, um, and then they will lose tons of weight during the rut. And then they basically disappear. So I would encourage you, when we get to October, November, to see if you are not really seeing the bucks anymore. It gets a little harder because in December they start to lose their antlers, so you can't tell the, the does from the bucks very easy. But I anticipate, if you start looking at the ones that you see around your house commonly, You'll notice that the males are tucked away and not making themselves very obvious because they're in recovery. They're kind of hiding, laying low, recovering from a very arduous couple months. 
We're in the red right now. The other thing that you'll see is that the, the males get really thick necks um, and they're all pumped up on testosterone so that they can fight. It's really to, to help them fight. But they might also look better to the ladies, who knows? Um, let's see. They're super curious. It's amazing how many of them came up to check the camera. They come up real intimate with the camera. And they're across the landscape. This actually is for the Finleys, I see. You guys made it tonight. And while they're reportedly mostly active during the day, or uh, during the night, uh, and we did get quite a bit of activity at night, we actually found that they were very active during the day. So it's been one of the interesting things when I was reviewing some of the literature for this talk. I was realizing that um, what we see on the preserve, what we have seen with this camera project, is different than the averages that are reported. Now the averages that are reported are just that, they're averages. But it's been very interesting to see that a lot of the literature would classify deer as nocturnal, primarily nocturnal with some diurnal activity. And, I, and when you look at our numbers here, the blue is showing that we have a lot more daytime activity and much less nighttime activity. There's some switching that goes around in the fall and that may have to do with the rut. Um, this, my guess, has to do with the fact that things have greened up, they've got fawns, and they're now eating for two. And so they want to they be out in the grasslands during the day when there's not a lot of predator activity, and they can, they can eat a little bit more um, peacefully. Females will travel in small family groups, so if you see a group of deer together outside of the breeding season, it's typically going to be a family group. They'll all actually be related to each other. And then the young will stay with the mother for a year to a year and a half before, if it's, if it's a female, she'll let her join the group often. But if it's a male, she kind of kicks them out and says, go find your bachelor group. And the bachelor groups are not necessarily related. So the females definitely have this familial connection. And the, the bucks, they're just hanging out with a bunch of bachelors. Um, the, uh, and then once they have kind of established dominance within their bachelor group, they'll actually break off and during the breeding season and then potentially for the rest of their lives, they'll be a little bit more solo if they're dominant because they, you know, they can't hang out with their underlings. They've got to stay the boss. Um, one of the most iconic thing about deer are the spotted fawns, right? They're just adorable. Um, the deer can have two, they have two fawns on average. Often people refer to them as twins. Um, they can have one deer, a young deer, a young doe will often have one fawn her first year, and then after that, typically two. Sometimes they have triplets. Um, I have heard of does taking on an additional fawn if a mother gets killed or something. So sometimes the triplets might not be all hers. Uh, they are about six to eight pounds at birth, and fascinatingly, this is one of the only species I've ever heard this about, is they have no scent. How a baby can be born and not smell at all is amazing. Um, let alone a fur baby that's sitting in the grass by itself for hours at a time, waiting for mom to go and forage and come back and pick it up. That's what they do. For the first couple weeks, they will literally get deposited in the grass. Mom will say, don't move, stay here. And they will hold still. And it's a really good strategy. If they don't smell and they don't move, they're not drawing attention to themselves. So unless a predator stumbles across them, they're probably going to be just fine. The challenge, of course, is when humans get involved. And every fall, the um, SPCA and likes put out advisories that say, if you come across a deer in the grass, please don't bring it in. It's supposed to be there. Mom's coming back. But we don't understand. This is crazy. It's a tiny little fireball, like, just hanging out by itself. Where are the parents, you know? Um, so note to self, if you ever come across one, take some pictures, because it's a pretty unique experience to run across one. Letter B. Uh, let's see, what else? So um, here's a classic example of the two little fawns following mom. They can walk within minutes of being born. It's pretty impressive. One of the things that I really love about deer is their silent communication. They do make noise. The fawns will bleat. Males will grunt. Um, if you startle them, if you've ever been out on the trail and you hear it a kind of sound, and then maybe a crashing through the brush. It was probably a deer. It will scare the living daylights out of you, and you probably could be convinced that it was a bear. 
but the reality is, is that it was probably just a deer that you spooked and it ran away. But most of their communication is actually in pheromones. They've got uh, a gland on the outside lower leg that literally will tell the rest of the group, alarm, something is wrong. And then they have another gland on the inside of their leg that they will come, they'll kind of bow down as they walk up to each other and catch the whiff of, and it tells them who, who each other are. It's a good way of recognition. Instead of recognizing a voice, they just recognize the scent of another individual. My favorite is the interdigital uh, gland, which is actually between the two hooves, which they refer to as toes. And as they walk, they can release this pheromone on the trail and leave a trail for the rest of the group to follow. So even if they get out of sight of each other, they can follow along the trail. It's pretty incredible. I also wonder how mountains use that. I wouldn't be surprised if they use it as a way to track their prey. But I actually didn't see anything in the literature about that. And then the males have a lacrimal uh, gland that is right on the inside of their eye. So if you had a camera out and you got a series of pictures of the buck rubbing his eye on your camera, he wasn't just trying to push it off the post. He actually was trying to mark it because it's how they mark territory. So we used our data that we acquired through the camera project uh, to try and predict where we were seeing different species. Um, some of these maps I've shown before, um, but I just wanted to bring them back into rotation for those who haven't seen them. And what we found is this, is this is what we call a heat map. So the red areas are areas that are more likely to have that species. And the green areas are areas that are less likely to have that species. It doesn't mean that we find them in every single spot that we find red, or that there's more of them in one area than another. It just means that that's where the, they like to hang out. So the red here is grasslands. So to give you reference, this is where the hacienda is right here. So this is the green of the flats that we would look out at over here. And then this is Pinion Peak here. And so you can see the deer spend most of their time in the grasslands. Now that said, we actually don't see deer up on Pinion Peak very often. So it's not a guarantee that they would be there. It's just a higher likelihood. They do not like the scrubby area. These areas that are along Shamasal Ridge here, and we've got a lot of chaparral and coastal scrub, they're not big fans of that. So they, if you are looking for deer, look for them in the grasslands. Their home range, surprisingly small, um, it obviously depends on the habitat around them, but uh, if your lot is, say, 40 acres, their home range would be two lots up to maybe the size of the flats. So they don't move very much. So the deer that you think that you're seeing the same one over and over in your yard, you are. It's probably the same individual. And they're very happy there. Uh, they like to browse shrubs, which I know uh, in the landscaping can be very frustrating. But I'm happy to tell you that, that poison oak also counts as shrubs, and they do like poison oak. So they have a little ecosystem service there. Um, we can encourage them to eat more of that poison oak. We'll all, we'll all do better if we can figure out how to teach them to do that more. Uh, they eat new tree shoots and uh, lichen, if you've ever seen them eating the lichen. It's very nutrient rich and has a lot of nitrogen in it. So you'll see them reaching out, grabbing that. They are ruminants, which if you're not familiar with that term, it means they actually have four stomachs. And much like a cow, they will eat something regurgitate it, chew it for a while, and then swallow it into another stomach, which is pretty remarkable, and then do it again. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. It's a way for them to digest uh, plant cellulose, which is very hard to digest. We eat it because it's good fiber. But they're actually trying to get more than fiber out of those plants. And then, as I mentioned with uh, our map data, they enjoy those open areas. So coyotes are probably the other one that I hear a lot of questions on. Um, and they, even though we didn't get as many pictures as the deer um, with our project, we see them a lot. We see them out on the flats. Um, and there's kind of a mixed sentiment about them. Some people are in love with them. And then others have some reservations. They're a little nervous about them. And as long as they have a healthy amount of fear from humans, there doesn't seem to be any problem. So. When we do start seeing brazen coyotes that are howling in front of the hacienda at 2 in the afternoon, which definitely happened this spring, um, we, the Conservancy staff, at least, and you are welcome to join us, uh, haze them. And what we do is we chase after them. We literally, I, that day I ran from the 
front of the hacienda all the way to the far side. Um, I might have walked a few spots because it's a long way. Um, but uh, that teaches them that we're not okay with that behavior. But when they're doing what coyotes normally do, um, they're really cool animals. People often will see them from afar and think that they're like 100 to 150 pounds. I've heard this many times. Oh, it was a huge coyote. It was huge. Must have weighed 100 pounds. And actually, they're mostly fur. Um, they only weigh 20 to 50 pounds. Up in the north where it's colder, um, and sometimes they can co-hybridize or they can hybridize with wolves, you'll get maybe a 75 pound uh, coyote. But probably not going to see one much bigger than than 50 to 70 pounds. The is it hybridized? They can. They can what does hybridized mean? It means that they can crossbreed with the wolves. So they can actually inter interspecies breed. And then you get something called a koi wolf. They're not super common, um, but they have been found. Uh, they have a bushy tail. And this is a really easy way to tell them apart from other canids that you'll see around. In particular, when they're running, it stays down. So there's definitely been times when I've seen a streak at night and tried to figure out what it was. Was it a fox or was it a coyote? And if you look for that tail position, you can tell the difference. They also have a black tip on the end of the tail, but so do fox. So uh, that's not super distinguishing. They have high-pitched yaks and chirps. Uh, their Latin name is Barking Dog. Um, and I'm sure... If anybody here has not heard coyotes yipping out here in the evening sometime, I would encourage you to turn the music off and spend an evening outside listening to the sounds of nature. Because it's kind of it kind of gives you some goosebumps, but you also can't help but smile. It's a really amazing experience. Uh, their eye shine is greenish gold, as opposed to the deer, which were white. And they can live eight to ten years, um, but there are very poor estimates as to the statewide populations. Um, and eight to ten years is very dependent on where they are. There, this I, I feel like this picture is quintessential of a coyote. He's got those big ears, gauged, looking at the camera, wondering what that digital sound is he's hearing. He's probably scented the fact that we have changed the camera, right? We've gone in, we changed the batteries, we checked the cards, we did whatever we needed to do. So it's got our scent on it. And he's just out of frame, just wary, but curious. Can't help but wonder what's going on. And I feel like this is, this is a coyote. This is exactly what they are. They're typically not brazen. They're typically pretty wary, wondering what's going on. And they're just super interesting animals to watch. They're also very curious about things around them. So this is the cable that is holding the camera on the tree. <laughs> and he's trying to figure out if it's one, edible, and if not, maybe he can take it home for the kids to play with, you know? So. But the coyotes, we see a pretty even distribution of daytime and nighttime activity. They can be active any time of the day, and it depends on what their objectives are. So in the, in the winter, this would be February, the second month of the year, they're going to be mostly nocturnal. And then as we get into the warm green season, they're going to be active with everybody else, but they're, they're splitting their time between daytime and nighttime. And we see that trend run through the rest of the year, where they're, for the most part, they're splitting their time, daytime, nighttime, whatever makes sense for them. They can run up to 40 miles per hour, which if you think about it, I think a cheetah can run 60 miles per hour, so it's really fast for, for most animals. Uh, they are extremely adaptable. In our uh, data, we found that they actually are one of the few species that preferentially hangs out in the scrub and, sh and chaparral areas. Almost everything else is really focused on the woodlands and the grasslands. And it makes sense because one of their favorite foods is brush buddies, brush rabbits, squirrels, and small rodents. And that's that's where those species often are hanging out, is in these scrubby areas where there's lots of seeds, great cover, and they don't have to worry about all the other predators that are spending most of their time in the woodlands. <laughs> so the coyotes have got it dialed in. So if you live in those habitats and see a coyote, that's your buddy on rodent control. They are so adaptable across the landscape, though, that they have actually found that there are thriving populations of coyotes in the middle of L.A. 
So we used to think of raccoons and possums as being the ones that are really adaptable to these urban spaces, but coyotes are now showing that they can do it as well, for better or for worse. They are opportunistic, as I mentioned, they love small rodents, so here we've got one that's got, uh, I think it's a ground squirrel, it's kind of hard to tell, it's a little out of focus. This one is from the Fisher's camera, um, it's actually a fawn head. They will go after dead things when they come across it. Probably didn't kill it itself, but definitely opportunistic when it comes across something that's already dead. Uh, they typically don't eat a lot of uh, uh, vegetable or fruits or anything, but you do find berries in their, in their scat sometimes. But they're primarily <coughs> carnivorous. And then when they breed, they will hang out in uh, certain areas We've had dens around the flats before. I don't think it happened this year because we didn't hear any um, accelerated reports of, of uh, aggressive coyotes in the flats once we got into the breeding season. But what they'll do is they'll find a good spot to put a, that they can tuck down under the ground, whether it's under a rock or a log. And, um, and then they basically will raise the, the, um, the cubs, or the um, pups, as a family. Uh, and when a female and a male choose to successfully, well, when they choose each other and successfully rear young, they typically will stay together for a couple years. Not true monogamy, but more of a like strategic relationship, like, hey, that worked, let's do that again. So, five to 10 pups at a time, and they're typically only in family groups into the fall, and then they'll split off for the, um, for the early spring, come back together in the immediate family group again when they're breeding. Black bears. We did not get very many pictures of the black bears, but each one was the gold mine. It was just amazing what we did find. We had um, five different, six different areas that we had bears reported, and these were all by camera. Um, actually, seven if you count a hiker report. So the first one was up at the uh, Maddox's, and that was up in Corral Run. So if you're familiar with that, it's on the other side of the mesa, on the north side of the mesa. Same time we had one show up, a different bear show up at Garza's Creek, in the upper Garza's Creek. And then this one was on the Rancho San Carlos, or uh, sorry, then the next one was in Williams Canyon. And then this summer, this was the next summer, this is along the Rancho San Carlos corridor. And then the Vesudibans reported seeing one in their driveway. We've gotten two sightings up on Cory, and the last one was someone saw one up on Trapper's Loop. Um, actually, it was right before the fire. So we're seeing bears all over the preserve, quite honestly. And we know that our neighbors over in this, uh, Rancho San Clemente see them out on their property. So we've got bears in the area, which I think is really interesting. Most of our sightings have been in the summer, but the last, uh, our last quarry sighting was in December of this past year. So they stand at about three feet at the shoulder, but when they stand up, obviously they're they're one of the few wildlife species that we deal with that actually stands up on its hind legs. And they can be six to even seven foot tall when they stand up. So they are imposing presences. 150 to 300 pounds and variable in coloration. This is one of the big things that I get questions on. People will say, oh, I saw a brown bear. Does that mean we have grizzlies? I'm like, no, no, we don't have grizzlies here anymore. The last one was hunted in 1920 and we haven't had grizzlies in the state ever since. What you're seeing is some of the color variation. So while they are black bears, they can come in a cinnamon color, like this bear, and they can even come in a very blonde color, which is pretty amazing. They'll be this very beautiful blondish yellow coat. Um, and they're all still black bears. That's just the color morphs that they have. They can growl when fighting, um, or they can woof and whimper when communicating with the cubs, but typically they're pretty quiet. Their eye shine is red. It's one of the only ones that I came across that is red. So if you see red eyes, it's probably, and, and it's big, it's a bear. If it's small and down on the ground, it's probably a whippoorwill, uh, or not a whippoorwill, um, a poor will, which is a nighttime bird. Um, but if it's big and you see red eyes, good chance that it's a, it's a bear. They can live up to 30 years if they are not affected by human uh, influence. But on average, due to um, hunting and roadkill and other issues like them getting into trash and things like that, it can be closer to 10 years for them. 
I was amazed to see that uh, the statewide count is between 25 and 30,000 bears in the state. That said, our area only has about 10% of that. This was the series from Williams Canyon. Um, so this was back in 2015, one of the first bear sightings that we had on the preserve. And uh, I was sad that he didn't come back and show us his face, but um, pretty fun. So this is not a terribly updated map, but it's the best one I could find. This is the distribution of bears in California. And you can see that Monterey County has a very short uh, presence recorded down here. We know that they're up in our area. Um, what's really interesting about the black bears is that until about 1950, we didn't have black bears in our area. We had grizzlies historically in this area, but we didn't actually have black bears. And in the 1950s, people started reporting seeing them, and their, their numbers have definitely increased along the central coast. What happened was when, black, when grizzly bears were removed, there was basically an opening in the ecosystem. And the pressure that had kept black bears out was relieved. So there was a natural migration that started coming down the Sierras, crossing across the transverse range, and then coming up the coastal range. But it was a trickle. And in the 30s, and then again in the 60s, because there was some concern about our bear populations, um, Fish and Wildlife actually did some relocations of bears down here in the southern mountain range. And so between the natural migration and those translocated bears, they started to establish populations in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties, and, and in Ventura and such. Um, and now they continue to move north. So, I would assume that we will start to see more bears as the years go on. Um, thankfully, the preserves have been very progressive in our trash management, which is ultimately the biggest issue for bears. And so the fact that your trash has to be tucked away into an enclosed container behind doors is awesome. And that is the best thing that we can do to make sure that we coexist with wildlife in general, but bears in particular. They. Uh, have a variable range that some of the reports were saying they can go up to 15 miles. They can go a lot farther than that, particularly when they get relocated because they got into trash, they got a button in their ear, and they got sent down south, which uh, one of our bears we think was one of those. He had a button in his ear. Um, and they can travel up to 30 miles per hour when they're running fast, which is amazing. They are opportunistically omnivorous. They'll eat anything, including your trash, as we mentioned. Uh, but they really prefer berries, and 95% of their diet is insects, which is incredible. It's grubs and bees, and they really enjoy wasps and such. Um, and then they also will eat carrion, dead things that they come across. They'll, they'll go for all of it. What they're coming down to our neighborhood for in the summer, I believe, is the manzanita berries. In fact, actually just today, Rodrigo was out working in the uh, Mesa area and found some old scat that's just chock full of manzanita berries, and we suspect that it was very scat, probably from last year. Most of the pictures we got were something along the lines of this. So they're not supposed to be nocturnal, according to the descriptors, but they're going to be wise about moving around humans and trying to be you know, on the stuff. <coughs> but this series actually was really blurry, and so it was kind of hard to see, but there were two bears in this. So generally, they're solitary, except for when they're courting each other and then when the female has a cub. Um, they don't truly hibernate in this area. A lot of people have asked me that, say, you know, oh, will bears go away in the winter because they go hibernate, right? Well, no, they, they hibernate up north where the snowfall covers all of the food options. But down here, our climate's really mild, and so they can get food most of the year. They're just better times of year for so they will get a bit lethargic, um, we call it um, torpor sometimes, when their metabolism dials down a little bit. But they can still leave their den and they can move around and um, get into trouble or go exploring, whatever it is. They are very strong tree climbers and they can smell up to 20 miles away. If the winds are right, it can bring scent in. So that's why they're known for going all the way down to the bay. Because think about all that odiferous fish smell, right? Pulling their nose. And then I love this description, is they are diurnal with naps. Which sounds like a pretty good way to roll, personally. Um, they will use dens as well when they're breeding. 
and they have an average of two cubs, but they only breed every other year because the whole process of um, torpor or hibernation when they do a full hibernation and then rearing two cubs on that is a very intensive process. And they actually will put on close to 35% of their body weight in excess as they're going into these winter months, um, particularly up in northern climates where it's a lot colder and, and more challenging. Uh, and then they uh, will hang out with their cubs for a year and a half to two years. The feral pigs, wild boar, wild hogs, European boar, many names. Um, I have to say, I really wanted to get a nice like, clipped picture of one, and for whatever reason, they never come out in focus. I don't think of them as fast moving in general. Um, it may have something to do with the mud that they are wearing. It's like a camouflage to the camera. But um, they're not native. I mean, most of you, I'm sure, are aware of the history of the European boar here on the preserve. Right? Ground zero for the introduction of European boars in California. In 1925, George Moore decided that he really wanted some of these fun boars that he'd been hunting out in North Carolina, and so he arranged to have them brought over. And um, there's a letter from um, Mr. Hurst writing to George Moore about how uh, his boars had finally made it down to his place, and would he please take them back? <laughs> It was not actually the first time that feral pigs had shown up in California. The Spaniards had been dropping pigs in bays as a, as a kind of um, planting seeds of the pig variety, essentially. They would kick them off the boat and figure they can go and forage, and next time we come into this bay, then there'll be all these pigs for us, and then we can just harvest those. So we've had feral pigs in the state and across the U.S., along the coastal um, portions of the U.S., since the 15 to 1700s, depending on whenever the Spaniards first arrived. But the European boar and the feral pigs have all blended so much together that there's really no distinction between them anymore. In fact, I did my master's work on pigs in Texas, and I knew a student who was bound and determined he was going to come up with a genetic test to tell the difference because people wanted to know in the hunting industry. And I was like, why? Like, they're all the same animal in the end. The domestic pigs come from European boars. He was unsuccessful in the end. I've not tracked the process. There's probably much better tools these but interestingly, I was describing the deer and the bear as both being about three foot high at the shoulder, and so are pigs. Uh, so they are all of relatively similar size, which I find amazing when you think about it. They can be up to 400 pounds, but um, the average is typically closer to 250 pounds. So you'll hear lots of people tell stories about giant pigs, but most of them are probably like fish stories. I'm probably not quite that big. Um, they also have upward curved tusks, so the, the ones that lift the, the top lip up, and that's typical of the European um, variety. Our native suid species of sorts is the peccary, and it has downward tines, and they're distant cousins. Uh, they don't make a ton of noise, they do snort, um, as if you've ever been around a herd of them, they're pretty chatty, snorting at low volumes, and can screech an alarm. One of the interesting things about them is they don't have eye shine. So it may be why they are commonly um, found as roadkill, um, is they don't have eye shine. And eye shine is based on the rods to cones uh, ratio in the back of the eye. And it also has to do with the, um, uh, another membrane that's back there. But basically, the rods, high content of rods to cones um, is typical in night hunters. So a lot of the nighttime predators. And so you'll get a lot of color in those eyes. So species that did not necessarily need to work at night didn't evolve that kind of uh, eye structure. And so they actually don't have an eye sign. That said, the pigs are definitely moving around at night because they want to stay out of the way of humans. Uh, they work in familial family groups called shoals. Uh, males, again, are bachelor groups, much like deer. They tend to hang out near water because they don't actually sweat. They don't have sweat glands, um, which makes it very hard for them in hot climates. Um, but they figured out how to find mud holes and such. They also are opportunistically omnivorous and will eat pretty much everything, but they do love grubs and tubers. And so that's what they're looking for. When you drive down the road and you see that rooted up material along the side of the road, we have very kindly mowed it and made it very accessible for them. 
and then they go through and they're working on the little grubs that are eating the roots of the grass and they're looking for truffles and tubers and other underground fungus that might be growing. Uh, one of the many reasons that feral pigs are considered a pest, in addition to the fact that they tear up lawns and tear up roadsides and get into agricultural fields, is that they actually eat wildlife that we care about. So they're notorious for getting into ground nesting bird nests, so they'll eat quail nests and um, any other opportunistic nests that they come across. And one study found that one pig had 49 spade foot toes, toads in its stomach. Now, if you think that it takes about four to six hours for digestion to make things impossible to identify in the stomach, that tells you that that pig ate 49 spade foot toads in less than four hours. <laughs> and the spade foot toad is an endangered species. <laughs> so it's definitely a recipe for trouble. And that's only one of many examples that I was reading about. Another one had like seven different rodent species in its stomach. So um, pretty amazing capacity for eating. Uh, and Lots of, lots of really damaging activities in the ecosystem. Uh, this one, I pulled this picture out because I'm not really sure what's going on here. I think he's like losing half of his fur. Um, but we're only seeing big animals like this. We're, we don't see piglets, which is crazy to me. And um, I'll circle back on that in a minute. But the big ones that we're seeing, we're not seeing very many of them. As I said, it's just that fraction of the pie chart. But it's weird that pigs are known for breeding like crazy, right? And we're just not really seeing them. Where we do see them is in the forest areas. So this is, this is pretty much a hot cold map, right? There's no yellow on this one. So they're hanging out in the, where we have woodlands, riparian woodlands, oak woodlands, they, you name it. They're hanging out where the trees are. And then the green is where we got our grasslands and our scrub habitat, and they're not as interested in that. They can have huge home ranges, but where things are good, like here, they probably wouldn't move too much. And they're found in over 34 states these days, so they are on the move in general, but a lot of that is human movement, much like George Moore. They can live four to six years, and in, in the state of California, there's an estimated 200 to 400,000 animals just in uh, California. They estimate about 5 million feral pigs across the U.S. They're a big problem. As I mentioned, the reproduction on the preserve is a real mystery because the joke when I was working on them in Texas is that they would have 8 to 10 piglets and 15 would survive because nothing killed them and they seem to randomly, spontaneously reproduce. Um, and they can, they can breed at under a year of age. They can have several litters in a year. It's pretty impressive. But we're just not really seeing them here. And I suspect that it has something to do with the predator population. <laughs> this is, if you watch the clock up here, the mountain lion comes through about three minutes after the pig. Now, the mountain lion does look significantly smaller than that pig. Um, it does not preclude the lion from going after the pig. They do go after very large prey sometimes. But I suspect that the prey um, that they're really focused on is, is piglets. So in four <coughs> years of having the camera project out, we clearly have not documented everything on the property. There's, if you remember that map, there were definitely some holes in our map where things are, it's really t difficult country to get into. But we have seen baby everything. We've seen baby raccoons, we've seen baby mountain lions, bobcats, coyotes, you name it. We've never seen a baby pig. I don't think it's just the predators, there may be something else going on, and our neighboring properties are reporting the same thing. They're just not seeing the pigs locally, but I can't help but think that that may have something to do with it. So striped skunks, one of the others that I highlighted, um, they are not commonly seen, and I think everyone's probably just fine with that, <laughs> but they are really interesting. Um, they're Sizable, I don't think you, I, I don't think I really understood how big they are. When you count the tail, they're almost uh, two feet long. And they can weigh up to 14 pounds. I mean, that's the size of a large house cat. Um, they have that white stripe that starts on their head and then splits down the sides of their backs. And then the, the tail can be any variety of, of white and black combination. Some of them don't have any white on their tail. Some of them have two nice stripes down the side, like Pepe Le Pew. I think he has two stripes. 
Um, but uh, they, they've got a, a surprising variety in how their tail coloration is, but they've got those two stripes that go down the sides. Um, they can fire the musk from the base of their tail 9 to 12 feet with accuracy. <laughs> so it gives them a wide berth when you, when you do come across them. Um, that's a highly evolved skill, i got to say. It's pretty impressive. I also enjoyed the description of the noises that they make. It was by far the most descriptive of any species I came across. They can squeal, hiss, screech, whimper, grumble, smack their lips, and stomp. So, when you're sitting out on your patio at night, or if you wake up to some very bizarre noises at night, it could be a variety of things. I will tell you that owls, juvenile owls, have a real habit for making very strange noises too. But Think about this list, and maybe it's a little skunk having a squir uh, squabble outside. Their eye shine is a deep amber. This, I, this is one of the more recent sequences that we put together. Um, we think of being scared of them, but they, he was definitely scared of the camera. <laughs> he's not backing up, and he's not putting that tail down until he's long gone. So they typically are solitary, nocturnal, they hang out under houses unfortunately, but their normal place to hang out is under trees or under rocks and burrows. Uh, they have a pretty small home range, so if you got one hanging out, it's probably going to stay there. Um, and uh, we are happy to work with you if you do have issues with skunks. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, horned owls, great horned owls, are a primary predator of skunks. So they're good to have around. They have no sense of smell, and they could care less if the smell smells. <laughs> they eat everything. Um, mice, which is a good thing. Insects, in particular, they really love yellow jacket nests. If you've ever been hiking along and seen um, like a whole bunch of uh, wasp nests dug out of the ground, that was a skunk. They will literally go in. They're totally immune to the stings. And they'll just go in and go crazy like a little badger. Pull the nest out, eat all the larvae, they're totally happy. The other thing that I was absolutely stunned to discover today is that they are immune to rattlesnake venom, which is amazing to me. And then I proceeded to find an article that talks about all kinds of things that are immune to all kinds of venoms. It was amazing. The Conservancy team probably has all read it now, and you can ask them after, uh, after the talk. But they, the um, skunks will eat snakes, and so if they go after a rattlesnake, they don't have to worry about the venom, which is pretty amazing. They also, it's a spring birth for their young, um, and it's not uncommon when they do have young that they follow in single file, much like geese. So that was something that was reported in multiple sources. I thought that was interesting. Um, we didn't do a habitat map for them, but they would show up in woodland areas um, with focus around water. And then their nighttime activity is pretty predictable with a little bit of daytime in the, in the winter. So bobcats are the one that I was saying were surprisingly common in the camera project. You all, I am sure, have seen bobcats out. Um, I may have relayed this story once before, but when Rodrigo first got here in January, um, you know, winter was very, it was very green, everything was starting to green up, and all the animals were starting to get more active. And um, he came in after about a month and he was like, I think you guys have a problem. You have too many bobcats. They're like everywhere out here. He was he was joking, but the reality is is that he had, he's been a biologist for years and he'd never seen anything like it. We have a lot of bobcats here, and it's pretty amazing. And they're very bold. I find them very entertaining because they're just kind of doing their own thing. They'll look at you and be like, "Yeah, what's up?" You know. So um, <laughs> this picture cracks me up. So he was he's it's, he's looking very California right there. So, I want to point out the weight on the uh, bobcats. They can be 15 to 35 pounds. Now, do you remember how big the coyotes average? 20 to 40, right? So we're talking about bobcats that can be almost as big as a coyote, but their fur is much lower profile, so they don't look as big. But just to keep that coyote size in mind, they have uh, black markings on the back of their ears, and they have little tufts on the top. Uh, reminiscent of a lynx, which is um, one of their relatives. 
but not as prominent as a lynx. They will yowl in distress and aggression, so if you ever hear any strange cat-like noises, that it could be uh, a bobcat or it could be a mountain lion. And their eye shine is yellow amber. This was one of the more interesting maps that we put together because they literally only want to be in the grasslands. They will see them at some of the other spots, little pockets, little riparian corridors, but they're really focused on the grasslands. And that's because their prey is rodents. They love gophers. And I think we all love that they love gophers. So uh, they spend a lot of time hunting on the grasslands, slinking through the grass, super stealth. Um, and we have a number of pictures where they're carrying rodents in their mouths. Their home range is about two square miles, so to keep that in perspective, the preserve is 31 square miles in total. So two square miles would be a little chunk of that. And um, they are strictly carnivores. There's really no evidence of them eating um, for nutrition purposes other things. They might, like your dog, eat grass because they've got an upset stomach or something, but in general they're all carnivore. Um, they have two to four young, and they um, are reported as liking most types of vegetation and habitat outside of the preserve. But as I said, we got a very clear pattern here with our data, which is pretty cool. Um, they are more active at night, but obviously people see them around during the day. So um, they pretty much split their time, mostly nighttime, and then about a third of the time they're daytime active. I love this picture because it's like angels are sprinkling down on the bobcat. <laughs> this is up on Cory. This one, the cat is playing with his food, um, has caught something and is literally throwing it up in the air. This is out on Long Ridge. This is something we posted on YouTube. If you're not following us on YouTube, you should follow us on YouTube. Um, but yeah, a nice little family of three kits. I love that one out at, at the end. And then this is the, the picture of the cat jumping up towards the food it was uh, catching. So here, this cat is spent, I think it was like 15 minutes playing with whatever it had caught. <laughs> it was definitely dead by then. <laughs> One of the things that I was most amazed at the beginning of the project was how much of this type of activity we saw. We saw mountain lions laying down in the trails. We saw, you know, the bucks sparring right in front of our cameras. And as much as I would like to take credit for having really good instincts on where to put the cameras, I think it's more that this is just happening everywhere. These animals are so comfortable here, and they're just living their lives, and they're doing cool stuff all the time, which is one of the many things that we've taken away from this camera project. So, mountain lions. I'm going to leave you with a cliffhanger on this one, because I know everyone really wants to hear about them. But I did tell you a lot about them last August, last year, and it was a great turnout, many same faces. And we actually have a guest speaker coming September 21st, please mark your calendars. Beth Shapiro, who is um, an author and a very um, uh, established geneticist who does, she does um, ancient genetics, but she also helps with current genetics. She's helping the uh, Santa Cruz uh, Puma project with some of their genetics. So she's going to be coming, speaking here on Friday the 21st. And she'll be talking about mountain lions. So she'll cover a lot of what I would otherwise highlight. So I'm going to skip over that and leave it as a teaser that you should come next month. Gray fox, one of the ones that we don't see a lot of because they really are nighttime uh, active. And they, but they also love rodents. So this is actually a small bunny, but they eat all rodents, not just the cute ones. Um, they, uh, they can be seven to 13 pounds, pretty good size. Um, their tail is a, equivalent to about half the length of their body. They, I often hear people say, I saw a red fox. I'm like, are you sure it was red? And they're like, yeah, it definitely was red. And they have this beautiful rusty color on the underside of their tail, on the sides of their body, and on their legs, and then down their whole front of their neck. And they're actually gray fox. They have a gray back and gray on top of their head. Uh, red fox do occur in California, but I have not heard any reports of actual red foxes on the preserve or in our area. 
and red foxes are not native, so we would be interested if you do actually see one. The red foxes are going to be red body, and then they have black socks on their legs. But the gray fox is one of our natives. It has short little legs and actually likes to climb trees. Um, when it's running, it will hold its tail out straight. And um, if, you, if anyone remembers a few years ago, the uh, What Does the Fox Say music video that was going viral? Anyone? No? All right, never mind. So you can look it up some late night when you're really bored. It's a very entertaining music video. Um, but the fox does actually say something. He barks and he yips, um, much like the coyote. Their eye shine is a red, reddish orange, uh, depending on the angle that you catch them at. And um, we get them in the scrubby habitats. Um, they really like the, uh, the dense vegetation where there's lots of those rodents, again, like the coyotes. Most of their activities is at night, as I pointed out, um, and uh, they've got a relatively small home range as well, similar to the bobcat. They are uh, fruit and acorn uh, specialists. They actually really like fruit. Um, they'll eat a lot of manzanita berries, and then um, some small birds, and then lots of small rodents, which is another good thing to have them around in your scrubby habitat. They are denning species as well, um, and are monogamous and will mate for life as well, much like the coyotes. Um, they are reported in chaparral and open forests, and that's where we're seeing them in our data as well. And six to eight years, so they're pretty long-lived for a small creature. So that was a whirlwind, um, and I wanted to include a lot more species, um, and so I just barely squeezed it in an hour. And I'm sure you guys have some questions. But I uh, hope you enjoyed. Hi there. I'm Julie Humphreys. I'm new. We have a buck in our backyard most days who has one, one horn and the other one is broken off. Is that painful for them? Um, it depends on when it breaks. Um, but some of them, so. We've actually seen one deer that always only has one uh, antler. And so it, it may be that, so there's a couple different things that can affect that. Um, if they had any uh, damage to their hormone system, so if they had testicular damage or um, if they had a, a damage to the top of their skull, it can affect the way that their antlers grow. Mm -hmm. um, so he may only have one. But can you see a stub on one side? Yeah. Or? Oh, okay. And he probably got into a tussle. Or the other, the other challenge with the deer is that um, during the fall when uh, they're in the rut and they're coming into the rut, they are all pumped up on hormones and anything that they run into feels like a fight. So we actually run into um, them getting it tangled in the story pole flagging. If it falls down, if you see that, please let us know and we'll work with the homeowner to make sure that it gets put back up. Um, because what they'll do is they're grazing and their antlers will catch anything that's a net. Um, or a string. Sometimes they sometimes they'll pull down our electric fence, which is very stretchy, so it, it rebounds really quickly. But um, their antlers can catch on all kinds of stuff. So it could be that they got into a really serious uh, sparring match, or it could be that they caught it on something. So, but as far as whether it hurts or not, I'm not really sure, honestly. But he will recover and probably have normal antlers next year. Is there? Uh a difference in the habitat between the mountain lion and the bobcat? Like, does the bobcat move away if there's mountain lions in the area? The way a black bear and a grizzly bear do? Right. Um, I'm not sure if they necessarily move away, um, but what our data has shown is that the mountain lions are really preferentially using the woodland areas, and the bobcats are preferentially using the grassland areas. That actually is a good, a good suggestion in the sense that the literature suggests that bobcats can exist anywhere. But in an area like ours, where we have a healthy mountain lion population, they may decide that the best place for them is the grasslands. And so the other species interactions around them could be really focusing them on the grasslands. Yes? Uh, <clears throat> two suggestions or requests. Mm -hmm. uh, most people in the preserve couldn't make it tonight. So if you could, if you could promote the talk 
on the weekly preserved life with a link to the presentation. Would you be willing to do that? Yes, so we recorded it. Um, right. So you're saying post it and then put a plug in for it in the next week? Yeah, and then if I'd, I'd like to go back to this, I'm sure others would too, if it could be uh, on the uh, Conservancy site so we could have that in the library. Yes, yes, we are building the library. Um, if you go to our website, there's a multimedia page, and it not only has our presentations from the last year or so since we started recording them, but it also has some of these clips and other interesting videos. One of the all time favorites is the Meet the Owlettes. If you haven't seen it, it's pretty darn cute. Um, but yes, thank you, thank you for that good plug. Could you give an overview of the turkeys? Yeah, so um, I, they were, I had to drop them out because I was literally running out of time. But uh, so turkeys are not native. Um, they were introduced, they've actually been introduced many, many times across the, uh, the West, uh, across California by Fish and Wildlife. And they were, hunt they were introduced for hunting purposes. Um, but they are uh, pretty fascinating in the sense that they have clearly adapted well and um, love to eat anything that they come across. So they're also omnivorous. They'll eat uh, bugs and seeds and reptiles. Uh, one of the things that we are a little bit worried about with them is the fact that they really like to eat lizards and snakes. Um, and if you are fond of your blue belly lizards, which we are, or say your gopher snakes, your garter snakes that eat a lot of uh, the rodents around the home, having the turkeys around is probably not the best. Um, there's not really management that you can do necessarily uh, for them but we are watching their populations. Uh, they are super gregarious, but they are also really important food for a lot of other species. I think mountain lions like to eat them, and the poults, which you're probably seeing some of the young turkeys out right now, provide a really good food source for a lot of hawks and the owls and the birds. Um, yes? Uh, speaking of populations, um, can you, the, the, the species that you shared, can you tell us some of the concerns you've got about populations turn too many and, and what they need, what are you doing about it? Or, yeah. Or do you need doing about it? So deer deer overpopulation of deer is a common conversation piece across the US. Um, and in particular white tailed deer on the East Coast is I mean their populations are really explosive and they can be a very big uh, vehicular vehicular collision risk. Um, we don't see that issue out here. In fact, California manages its deer populations um, in a very protective way um, when it comes to hunting. So they're actually always trying to recruit more deer by not allowing the harvest of does. So I'm not too worried about that. There are certainly areas, even within California, where you can get too many deer. Often they'll be um, pushed in by urban development or such into open spaces. And what you would see in that case is you'd see a browse line where you literally can see through the forest where everything has been nibbled because they love those new shoots and they will basically kind of prune the, the forest at this height. And that's your, that's your indicator that you've got, you've got a big deer problem. Uh, we have not seen that. I think it is large part because we've got so many predators. Um, it's not just the mountain lions, but the fawns are, are definitely um, preyed upon by all kinds of things, including golden eagles, which is pretty amazing. Um, the turkeys, I worry a little bit about their populations, but they have really ebbed and flowed. Even over the four years that I've been here, um, we're seeing some fluctuations. And so I, I figure that there's some checks and balances there. And the feral pigs would be the one that I'd be the most concerned about, but they seem to be self-regulated right now for whatever reason. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Christy, is there any other species that we are missing that we're thinking about population, overpopulation issues? No, not specifically overpopulation. I don't think we've seen any. And as a matter of fact, generally, population is terrific. We've got wonderful populations of even animals that are very rare outside the preserves. And it's just another example of what terrific care all of you do uh, take of your land. It's just really remarkable how well balanced you can be. We, of course, have some endangered species, and we're monitoring those species. And those are some of the groups that we'd like to see more of. But I can't think of any overpopulation issues that we're facing right now. Go for it. Go for so that. And maybe the bulls. This last year the bulls were pretty crazy too. Yes. Now, have there ever been any instances of coyotes or bobcats or mountain lions uh, attacking any humans or domestic animals here? 
on the preserve? Yeah. As far as I'm aware, there are no records of them attacking humans. I can clearly say that. There have been some instances where coyotes and um, dogs have had tussles. No, um, there's been no injuries that I'm aware of, but certainly a scary experience to have a coyote come at you when you have a dog on a leash. Um, but that was the year before, our, two years before I got here, I think. And it was a case of needing to haze them. They, they become complacent. Um, sometimes if food is left out for them, or if people, um, the challenge is, is that you want to enjoy the wildlife, and so you want to get close, maybe take a picture, sit and admire them. Um, and that experience with them teaches them that they don't need to be afraid. And so it's a, it's a really challenging balance because I do it myself where I'm like, wow, it's an amazing moment. And then I'm like, do I need to chase him now? You know? <laughs> um, so there was a, it was a case of them basically becoming habituated. Do Bob, think, oh, excuse me. Do, we think, do you think we need to worry about keeping a dog off a leash on the curb? It's a, it's a judgment call. We don't have a leash policy here. We have a voice control policy um, for the trails. Um, Small dogs, I would definitely recommend keeping on a leash, just so that they um, don't get out ahead of you and potentially attract something back towards you. That would be one of our big concerns. Um, and then the big dogs are going to be less of, a, of an attraction to, um, a, they, they will be more scary to those predators. But it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard question because it's really up to your instincts and the dog you have as well. Uh, Chrissy, you can speak more to that? <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, the dogs are probably more of a risk to the wildlife than vice versa. And so uh, keeping dogs close is good for keeping your animals safe. And it's also great for keeping our wildlife safe. Uh, so that's what we look for. That, uh, throughout California, the, the most problematic wildlife interaction tends to be between coyotes and dogs. They do have a, they are territorial, they do tend to mix it up, and coyotes can certainly injure your dog. Right. And bobcats, um, a lot of people are concerned about bobcats until they realize that there's very little evidence of them ever being aggressive. The few stories that I've heard is when they're rabid, um, but a healthy, normal bobcat, they may seem super brazen because they'll sit there and look at you and, and you know, you kind of have a moment with them, um, but they're not aggressive. We've not heard any issues of, of that um, at any of my, with any of my colleagues. No. Yeah, I would echo that with the bobcat. So a bobcat is essentially uh, the same level of risk as a house cat. And probably quite a bit less because the bobcat is quite a bit less likely to approach you. Uh, but even if they did, the kind of in injury it might inflict would be house cat style injuries. Scratch, perhaps, or bite. Uh, but that is a very, very rare. Uh, our bobcat, that's uh, one of the things that I think Christy does a great job at. If you look at our website, you can see uh, sometimes people uh, may use the, the terms uh, mountain lion and bobcat interchangeably, but they are quite different creatures, with the, the mountain lion being quite a bit larger. Uh, and there's a great picture on the website, and Dr. Christy has shared it many times, showing a, uh, it's a photograph, or it's a, a sketch of a bobcat next to a mountain lion. And the, the mountain lion is a real threat to that bobcat certainly uh, really shows the difference. So I am happy to continue to ask questions. I'm sure people have dinner reservations, so please don't feel rude and stand up. And, and Thank all of you for being here. And before you do jump up, I'd actually like to ask our board members here tonight to stand up so that you have an opportunity to say hello to them after, you know, as you start to to leave. We have, I believe, three board members here. Can I ask you to stand? Excellent. Ron and Kathy are preserve members, and Jeff Langholtz, our board chair, who uh, lives off of Preserve Bloomdale, is here tonight, too. And I do encourage you to greet him if you haven't had a chance to meet him yet. He's a terrific guy and also, uh, you know, just a rock star conservationist really knowledgeable about <laughs> conservation both here and internationally. <laughs> but thank you, Christy, again. She's our rock star in the truth here on, uh, on our team. Uh, and we really appreciate you coming out and listening and getting a chance to enjoy these photos. Thank you.